Good evening and welcome to all of the IBD patients and their loved ones tuning in to today's chat in honor of Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week. My name is Michelle Lampariello and I'm the Foundation's Senior Manager of Social Media and Public Relations. Over the past six days, we've shared many ways to make IBD visible in honor of Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week. Raising awareness of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is important to us because there is low awareness of IBD among the general public. There are millions of Americans living with IBD and you likely know someone affected by one of these chronic and incurable diseases. I'm joined by three members of the foundation's senior leadership team tonight, our chief marketing officer, Judy Hofstein, our chief scientific officer, Dr. Karen Heller, and our executive vice president of education, support and advocacy, Laura Wingate. Welcome. Thanks, great to be here. Thanks, Michelle, really excited. Thank you so much, we're delighted. Awesome, happy to have you. The purpose of tonight's chat is to discuss recent progress the foundation has made to increase awareness of IBD, support and educate patients, find cures and improve quality of life for patients. I would like to thank our sponsors, AbbVie, Amgen, Beringer Ingelheim, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Pfizer and Takeda for their generous support of Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week and for making tonight's chat possible. If you have a question about Crohn's or colitis that we don't get to tonight, our IBD Help Center is available to assist you. You can contact our Help Center by calling 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN or emailing info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. With that said, let's get started. Dr. Heller, can you tell us a bit about diet and why it's important for the foundation to study the relationship between diet, nutrition, and IBD? Thanks, Michelle. That's really a great question because food is so important to all of us and particularly in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease. But before I get to the food a little, I wanna set the stage, especially to help in people understanding what Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are. We know that people who develop Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis tend to have a genetic makeup that somehow predisposes them to get these diseases. And they have a gut microbiome, that is all of the organisms, mostly bacteria that live within our gut. And we all have about a hundred trillion organisms living within us. And mainly that's great for us, but in people who develop Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, somehow their microbiome goes out of whack a little. It's called microbiome dysbiosis, which means it really goes out of whack. And we know that the influence of the genes and the changes in the microbiome influence their immune response. So it, it, it acts up and it's too active and it tends to destroy cells in the body. And so it isn't a good combination. But we know that for someone to really develop the disease or to have worsening of the disease, there needs to be a trigger. We don't know all the triggers. We have ideas about some of them. And one in particular is food. And we know that food is really central to the disease because food interacts with the microbiome and alters it. Similarly, the microbiome has an influence over food. Food change can mod, mod, modulate, sort of uh, influence how active genes are. And it also can have a, a direct impact on the immune response and vice versa. All you have to do is look at a disease, a disease like celiac disease, where people have an immune response to the gluten to know what food can do to the, to the body when things get out of whack. And so we feel that it's really important to study this because each individual is sort of individually made up with their genes, their microbiome, their immune response, and how they react to food. So we think about, about this as finding a solution for precision nutrition, how to identify which particular diet would be good for a particular patient. And so we are studying this, we're studying a variety of diets in, in people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, looking to see the impact of the food on their symptoms, and then looking biologically. How is it impacting the immune response? How is it impacting the microbiome? And through this sort of deep dive into the actual details of what happens when you eat something, we hope to get to a solution so we can tell each individual patient 
how they're going to react to food. That's great. And so as the foundation is making these strides in diet and nutrition research, it's important to make sure that patients are up to date on the latest guidance regarding diet and nutrition. So Laura, can you share how the foundation approached patient education in 2022? Absolutely. And uh, as Karen, talk, Dr. Heller talked about, you know, we uh, are doing so much research and there are new advances in how IBD is treated, um, new information coming out all the time. And the foundation's role is to share that information with the patients, the caregivers, the extended friends and family of an IBD patient so they can better engage with their healthcare team and make the right decisions for their care. And the way we approach education at the foundation is to engage patients and caregivers and helping us prioritize our education initiatives each year. And then we work with uh, clinicians, nurses, psychologists, and dietitians and other experts in the field, hand in hand with the patients and caregivers to develop our education. We strive to make sure that we're meeting the needs of how people want to learn. So we don't just provide education in one way. We provide education in multiple platforms, whether that's a brochure for somebody who likes to read, uh, a YouTube video for people who like to watch uh, and learn uh, with a transcript at the end. Um, we provide website content. We provide blogs, working with our marketing colleagues. We provide all different types of ways um, that patients uh, can be educated and engaged and share that information with their friends and family. And it comes to diet and nutrition and all of our education, really, but I want to speak to what Dr. Heller just spoke to. Um, we're always striving to share the latest research that's being done, uh, translate that information into uh, a, a meaningful way. So if you're someone who wants to learn in YouTube, we got it. But if you're a PhD, we have the information for you in that format as well. Um, and uh, working together, uh, we have a whole variety of resources on our website around diet and nutrition, and we're constantly expanding our resources so that um, as each new research innovation takes place, we're updating our materials. As each new treatment comes uh, available for our patients, we're updating and also explaining why that's meaningful, why that's valuable um, to the patient, so they can then uh, go and talk to their healthcare team and make the best decision for them. Right. So, I'm, I'm sure many of the patients and caregivers listening know living with IBD can be an extremely stressful experience. So Dr. Heller, what is the foundation researching when it comes to stress? So as I mentioned, that I'm, we know that there are some triggers that people that get, that sort of have people get on this course of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and or other triggers that make it worse. <laughs> And we know that stress can be one of these triggers for certain people. So we're actually studying stress in two different ways. First of all, I want to emphasize that we take stress seriously. We don't think that it's somebody's, you know, like it's all in your brain. I mean, it may be in your mind, but that's because there's a biology and a disease associated with it. That, that you're reacting to this stress and that there's really a very strong mind-gut relationship. And I emphasize how important the microbiome is. So the relationship between the microbiome and the brain is really important and probably plays a key role in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And so we are looking into this in one study, we're looking at adults with ulcerative colitis characterizing those people who feel that they react to that their disease reacts to stress and those who don't. And the ones who do react to stress, they're being called high stress reactors. And it turns out that people with high stress reactivity are three times more, almost four times more likely to react to clinical flares than those people who don't react to stress. 
And so we're trying to figure out why that is true. And now the researchers are thinking that it does have to do with the microbiome and this mind-gut relation. The other thing we're looking at is in children, early life stressors. So it turns out, and when we're looking, the researchers have, have been looking at this in mice. And um, I mean, I'm not a rodent fan, but it is sort of sad for the model. They have to take the babes away from their moms. And that clearly is high stress. And they found in these mice exposed to this early life stress that they actually have more gut inflammation they have increased gut permeability, which is what happens in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So the barrier in the gut isn't as effective in keeping bad things out of, um, out of the, from the intestine into the body. And that these mice um, are more than the mice who haven't been exposed to stress. And so they're really doing more research with the mice to understand why this is happening. And in parallel, they're looking at adolescent children, ages 11 to 18, who are being evaluated through surveys and collection of blood and stool, who have suffered early childhood stress, like um, child abuse or death of a parent or major household dysfunction. And they are looking at their outcomes and they have found already that those who had more childhood adversity have been hospitalized with IBD symptoms more often. And so they're trying to figure out why that is. And again, as I said, looking at that mind-gut relationship. That's fascinating. So one of many stressful experiences that an IBD patient can have is needing a restroom and not being able to find one. And we know that this issue is exacerbated in cities because there is a lack of public restrooms. So Judy, can you tell us more about the foundation's open restrooms movement and what we're doing to address this? Sure, um, it is a huge problem across this country and it is not only for IBD patients, obviously, but certainly IBD patients experience this more than your average um, member of the public. Uh, and our mission at the foundation is to imp focus improving the quality of life for patients. And obviously that's all the research Karen's talking about, all the education Laura's talking about so that people can learn what to do with their disease and more medications and treatments can be developed through some of our research. But uh, another piece is just the everyday life of trying to find the restroom, a restroom. And so we have worked for many years on legislative issues. And in fact, that's in Laura's group spent, um, and we've partnered with volunteers around the country and legislation has passed, but there's a low awareness of the legislation. And in a sense, what we're doing is um, in that legislation is telling businesses, um, you'll be punished if you don't open your restrooms to people who ask because you should. And there's a law about that, but the businesses don't know about it. Patients don't know about it. And so we're trying to flip that on its head now with a new approach where we're trying to find the businesses who will happily open their restrooms to the general public. And really, um, if I had a choice of walking into the nearest business and just asking, but not knowing anything about them, but I had an app in my hand that said, well, you know, two doors down, there's one, and they're really happy to open their doors. I'll, I'll walk two doors down and feel much safer as a patient. Um, so we've been working with patients, um, with, uh, with retailers, with patients, with nonprofit partners to try to find those welcoming restrooms. And so we have some partners that have joined us. We have um, crowdsourcing where patients just contribute to the app and tell us where they've been that they have found um, a comfortable place. So we have built this app. It's called We Can't Wait. And it's really getting some traction in the market. So we're very excited about giving patients just another way to avoid, not a, to get out of the house with comfort because a lot of patients end up being socially isolated because they're afraid to leave if they think there's no restroom in the place they're going. This way they can check in advance. They can find out, they can map a course for themselves uh, of where they might go in case of an emergency. So. Um, we're excited about it. Uh, we hope people, it will make people more 
confident when they're out and about and traveling and um, really looking forward to continue to grow this movement to get more businesses to sign on. So open restrooms is just what it says. Please, we're asking businesses to open their restrooms and then providing that information through an app. So Laura, what we just heard from Judy is that the open restrooms movement is addressing restroom access through the lens of, it is a human need that can be addressed through human kindness. But there are other issues that IBD patients are facing where we need to take a different approach and try legislation. So can you share more about the foundation's advocacy work and specifically what we're doing with step therapy? My pleasure. And I'd like to take a step back and just explain what step therapy is for a moment. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, step therapy or fail first is an insurance mandated um, step before you get access to your physician prescribed medication. And that could be implemented when you go to fill your medication, you're informed that you can't have access to the medication that you and your doctor made a decision was the right treatment for you. And you're told you have to step to this other medication. And this um, causes delays in treating our patients. Pardon me. Um, it, it causes delays, which um, is really impacts our patients. It also can impact their the course of the disease. And so we have been advocating across the United States at the state level to um, pass step therapy reform. It doesn't our bills don't eliminate the need for step therapy, but puts guardrails around this insurance mandated practice that um, puts protections in for patients and their health care provider. So with our uh, passage of our step therapy laws, patients um, who need urgent access to their medication get a decision to, to their physician and themselves within 24 hours. And then for a, a patient who is in a not urgent situation, the response time is 72 hours. And um, we have passed this uh, step therapy form in 34 states so far. We are trying to pass it in all 50 states. And we are also working to pass this at the federal level because um, insurance plans can be given to you through your employer at the state or they can be given at the federal level. So it's really important that our advocates, our patients, our caregivers, and our healthcare providers that might be on the call tonight, they get engaged with us, join our advocacy network, and help us pass step therapy form across the United States. Thank you for that explanation. So switching gears a little bit, Dr. Heller, can you tell us more about what the foundation's doing to understand chronic pain? Yes, yeah, so it's definitely switching gears. Um, so we, we recognize that 30 to 50% of people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis who seem to have their inflammation under control, and so the thought to have their disease under control, continue to have chronic abdominal pain. So that's pain for more than three months. And, and that's, I think of that as unacceptable. So we, and we also realized that nobody had been researching this area, and yet this is of such great importance to patients and is so debilitating. So we, last year, we launched a chronic abdominal pain initiative. We are funding three projects, and they're all uh, really interesting. The first, and taking a very different approach to this chronic abdominal pain. The first project is just trying to get a handle on who are patients who have chronic abdominal pain. Do they have their inflammation truly under control? don't they? What are their symptoms? What are other characteristics of them? So that maybe we can start putting people in little buckets of you have this kind of pain or you have that kind. Of pain. And in addition to looking at how they sound and their symptoms and what they look like, we're going to be exploring the biological pathways under. Again, what's happening with the microbiome, because we actually, we know that there are a lot of peripheral nerves in the abdomen and connected to the bowel. So we need to understand what's happening in the bowel 
um, the microbiome, uh, and other aspects of people to have a handle on who's having this pain and maybe what's driving it. The other two projects are taking a more specific look. One, and also let me add that this is an international um, international effort. The first project is, is a project funded in, in England. This next one is one in Canada, and then the other is in the States. And the Canadians researchers have recognized that there are specific lipids, they're like fatty compounds, fatty acids, fatty compounds that the bacteria in the gut produce. And they've recognized that these lipids actually can moderate, can influence mood and pain perception. And they found that these two lipids are higher in, patient, in the stool of patients with IBD, especially those with pain. And so now they're looking at mice models and they're gonna be looking at people to see if, whether if you take um, a microbi microbiome transplant from a patient with IBD who has this abdominal pain, put that microbiome in a mouse, will that mouse also produce these lipids and will that cause pain in the mouse? And so if they can figure out that these lipids play a role in this pain, then we can figure out a way to influence, to perhaps destroy the microbiome, the, the bacteria that produce the lipids or neutralize the lipids or somehow get a handle on this to treat pain in a very innovative way. And the other project is a looking at a specific enzyme and an enzyme is a molecule in the body that makes other things happen. And this particular enzyme um, is, is, uh, is important in IBD itself and in inflammation. And it's also found that it may be causing pain in patients with IBD. So these uh, researchers are actually looking to find a drug that could block the pain and block the inflammation. And we have been funding this effort and we're very excited about another novel approach to um, treating the inflammation and especially one that might do double duty and treat the pain. Great, so given that IBD can be a painful experience and an isolating experience, it's important that patients are able to find support. So. Laura, can you share more about what the foundation has for patients who are looking for support? Absolutely. And uh, the face pa the, I, the foundation, excuse me, uh, offers a variety of support programs. Uh, we have programs that are designed to allow people to interact in the virtual space. So we offer a variety of online support programs for people that want to meet with other people from that are like-minded, that have similar experiences. For instance, we have an online group that is dedicated to the LGBTQ LGBTQ community, another that's dedicated to veterans, another that's dedicated to Black African Americans with IBD. Um, and uh, around the country, we host uh, in-person support groups um, in a variety of communities. So if you're looking to meet up with someone locally, we're able to do that through our 34 chapters around the country. These are volunteer-run support groups, so they um, allow patients to talk to other patients in a live community setting. Um, in addition, for maybe a mom who has a young person with inflammatory bowel disease who wants to talk to another mom, we have a program called Power of Two that allows um, peer-to-peer -peer discussions and sharing. Um, and we have that for all ages. So we have young people participating in this, older people participating in this, different, um, if we are, have a database that we're able to look. If you're somebody with an ostomy who wants to talk to somebody else with an ostomy, we're able to facilitate that matching and it's all done uh, through the virtual space. And uh, we're adding video technology so we can 
do this and see each other and talk to each other. Um, so there's a variety of support uh, programs available. And I, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention that so many of our patients also find our Take Steps program to be our biggest support program. So um, they come together in uh, a walk setting, they bring their friends, family, and in many cases, this is uh, where someone with IBD enters uh, our space and becomes connected to the foundation for the first time. So it's a really important program uh, in addition to all the other uh, supportive resources we have. Great, so Judy, as Laura mentioned, part of the foundation's support offerings is to connect patients who have had similar experiences. And we know that IBD can affect people of any race or ethnicity or gender or age, but can you tell us a little bit more about specifically what the foundation did this year to reach patients who speak Spanish? Sure, um, we've actually had tons of searches over the years for like about two pages that we had in Spanish and, and they were very heavily trafficked. So we've been aware for some time that there was a lot of need in a, a Spanish speaking community in the US and also outside of the US that looks for our resources. Um, and similar to what Laura was saying, we're, we're trying to meet people where they are. If they want videos, we have videos. If they wanna read, they can read, but we didn't have Spanish language materials and we knew there was a need. So um, this was really a very tight partnership between the marketing team, which is my team and the education team, which is Laura's team, because we had to translate all of their education materials they pre prepared and that required a lot of back and forth among us and extra reviews. And, and so we did that together. We translated the majority of our, our most um, trafficked pages. So where we saw patient interest, we translated those pages. Um, we created a microsite, which basically means that if you're in the Spanish language section you'll, and you click a link, you're not gonna pop out to an English section. You'll pop to another Spanish section if you want to go back to English, you have to go back to our homepage and, and find it that way. So it's, it's a self-contained unit with the most valuable information we have. We translated that. We then created a journey page, which is another way of navigating, which says, are you diagnosed? Are you undiagnosed? What do you need to know? And it clicked out always to those um, Spanish translated pages. And then that journey page attaches to, it has its own web website address, and we translated one of our public service announcements uh, to be in Spanish and to send people to those websites. We did get a little um, sponsorship funding, so we were able to promote that and really let people know that these pages now exist and the traffic. We launched it uh, during Hispanic Heritage Month, which was uh, just a wonderful opportunity for us and we have been getting a lot of traffic, so it's really exciting, and we hope to continue to build that out further. Definitely exciting. So, Dr. Heller, switching gears once again with you, can you tell us more about what the foundation is doing uh, to research pediatric IBD? Absolutely. So, we are very committed to really understanding um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in children and adolescents. And as I mentioned, one of our studies on stress is in children. I didn't mention, but actually one of the nutrition studies is focused very much on children as well. And then additionally, pretty much for about 10 years and it only recently ended, we have been, have been supporting the risk stratification um, study in looking at new onset pediatric Crohn's disease to see whether we could identify um, index, mar, sort of findings from um, uh, biopsies in the um, intestine to see whether we could figure out which kids were likely to have a difficult course and which kids with complications and which kids would have a milder course. And we're still looking into that because we got some great findings and we're trying to, we're, further exploring them to see whether we can actually get a prognostic tech test that could be used in the clinic. But those kids staged out, we studied them for more than 10 years and, um, and they're adults now. So we've launched a new study in children. It's called Cohort for Pediatric Translational Research in IBD, 
or capture IBD. And we're focusing in on children who have either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis at any point in their disease. But we're particularly interested in looking at kids who haven't been doing well on therapy like um, TNF blockers, or at least the first one. We really want to understand why a um, child doesn't respond and what can we know about that child to help us figure out what would be the, ne the best next drug to put them on. And so we plan to enroll about 2000 children and we're gonna keep bringing in new children so that we always have this group of, of a group of children to study until we figure all of this out. We can't really talk about pediatric IBD and the foundation without discussing Camp Oasis. So Laura, can you share uh, some updates from the 2022 camp season with us? And for those who may not know, what is Camp Oasis? So I'm just going to share that we also do pediatric education um, and provide resources for our youngest audience to our 18 and going into adulthood. We span that spectrum so that even children can uh, engage at the youngest age in understanding IBD through games and other resources. Uh, that's a big part of serving the pediatric community as well. But Camp Oasis uh, is uh, a very much beloved program at the foundation. Camp Oasis is a, a summer camp week long, uh, 11 sessions around the United States, where we bring uh, children seven to about 17 um, to camps with that are staffed by volunteers who have inflammatory bowel disease, GI nurses, GI doctors, uh, uh, psycho, uh, psychosocial uh, specialists, social workers, all on site at a typical summer camp. So we have swimming, we have boating, uh, we have all of the high ropes course, all the activities that any child would engage in at a camp program, but the, all the kids at Camp Oasis have IBD. And we do some special uh, sessions with Ask the Doc um, and Cabin Chats, where we talk about IBD and let our young pe people uh, share their stories, uh, build friendships, um, and we see a huge impact of uh, kids who go to Camp Oasis, um, often their parents report before they went off to camp, somebody, um, a young person may not have wanted to take their medications regularly. It might've been a little resistant when they had to take um, their uh, therapy and uh, kids coming back from camp, often their parents report, much easier um, to take their medications or now they have a friend to talk to about their uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis journey. And we have so many stories of lifelong friendships being started at Camp Oasis um, and being carried through to adulthood and into other programs and other engagement. There's actually a volunteer that um, started as a camper, then became a cabin counselor, then served as a patient uh, advisor to some of our research programs. And uh, we see this person, you know, one day uh, serving on the board of trustees, I'm sure. And so it's a it's a lifelong experience. Uh, we served uh, 1200 campers at our in person camps. And we also offer a virtual camp option for children who may not be able to go to the in-person camp due to their disease severity at the moment or other reasons, we host a virtual camp week as well, and then virtual sessions and engagement with our local chapters throughout the year. So highly encourage uh, our parents and our young people on the call to um, look for Camp Oasis applications come out in early uh, 2023. Great, thank you, Laura. So Judy, as we close out tonight's chat and get ready for tomorrow, which is the final day of Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week, can you share more about how and why the foundation is going to continue making IBD visible past Awareness Week through PSAs? Sure, I think that's a really important goal of the foundations because beyond, I, I, it's, so, it's so important to find better treatments and cures and, and provide support, but while people are sick, 
they need people to understand them. And that's why we say IBD visible, why we talk about awareness. And when I first joined the foundation, we did some research and we learned that people actually had heard the terms ulcerative colitis and heard the terms Crohn's disease. But then we asked them if they knew anything more than just the name. And the answer sadly was no for most of the population. So we decided we needed to do something about it because when people don't know what something is, if it's not that severe, they, especially when it's got to do with your gut and it's embarrassing and you don't wanna talk about it, you might avoid going to the doctor, you might avoid talking about it and you won't get treated. But we also know that early treatment, early diagnosis leads to early treatment, which leads to better outcomes for patients. So it is in our mission for people to know what they might be up against when they experience certain symptoms. So we, uh, a public service campaign um, or public service awareness campaign known as a PSA is uh, TV or radio uh, spots that are offered for free. We have to create them, but then broadcast networks run them for free if they like it. So there's a little bit of competition with um, whether you can get on the air or not, but we hadn't run one for over eight years or nine years because they're hard to produce and they cost money. So we had a wonderful agency, FCB Health, shout out to them because they donated their time to us. And without that, we could have never pulled this off. So we only had to pay for some small out-of-pocket costs. And we focused on basically building awareness of disease symptoms. So these spots talk about urgency, joint pain, diarrhea, bleeding, but in a way that is very uh, sympathetic and understanding. And so far our patients have loved them. And we've produced um, about five TV spots and two or three radio spots. And we're working on another group. So they have been on the airways in various markets. It's again, it's a, we can't control because we don't pay for where it gets aired but they have definitely been getting traction for us in the market. People are seeing them, they're aware of them. Um, it has increased traffic to our Find a Medical Expert page, which was exciting to us because that, that way we know we're helping people and they're finding doctors. So that's exactly what the goal of the campaign is. So um, we're trying to get people not to normalize their symptoms, but go talk about them. So the campaign is called Spill Your Guts. Um, and we mentioned before that we translated one of them into Spanish now too. So um, we're gonna run them as long as the TV stations keep running them and we're excited about it and more will be coming out soon that we'll be speaking to diagnose patients about um, things they can do to get better treatment than whatever they may be on now if they are feeling breakthrough symptoms or they're on long-term steroids. So. Uh, we're excited about it. We're going to keep going and we absolutely have to make IBD visible. That's our goal. Right. And I had a really great time chatting with you all. So I just want to say thank yous all around to Judy, to Laura, to Dr. Heller, as well as to our sponsors, AbbVie, Amgen, Behringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Pfizer, and Takeda for making tonight's chat possible. I hope that you, the viewer, enjoyed this session as well. And if you did, you'll consider sharing it with other members of the IBD community via YouTube. And as a reminder, if any questions about IBD or anything else we discussed tonight pop up, we encourage you to contact our IBD Help Center by emailing info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org or calling 1-888-MyGutPain. Thank you and take care. Thank you. Bye all.